I just got out of the shower. <laughs> that is okay. Hey, yeah, I just threw mine like back here. I was like, you know what? I'm not messing with you today. I feel that my my hair is, you know, I, I suffer from uh from shaggy boy hair. I have a <laughs> lot of hair, and it's I have a cowlick up front, I have oh. a swirl in the back, and and my sides don't grow at the same pace. So one side is always longer than the other. So I. I either have to be at the salon once a month or I have to suffer looking like I'm stuck in a 90s grunge phase. <laughs> that's that's not always a bad thing. Was, oh, was, no, it's not. I definitely own the look. That I'm just saying yeah. that's how it is. <laughs> yeah, same. I mean, because uh, having, well, yeah, having Celtic and Nordic jeans certainly makes for, yeah, yeah. Lots, lots of hair. Oh, oh, okay. So, um, you want to introduce yourself to oh, I every, everyone? Not that you really need a whole lot of introduction. I mean, oh, well, I think I, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not at Jenna Moresi levels of prolific <laughs> yet or anything. I'm not, That's I'm true. not Meg Latour over here. No, uh, you, you, not. you haven't inadvertently started your own cult on accident. <laughs> <laughs> why you gotta put my plans on the business uh, why why you why you that's supposed to be on the down low that's we true. talked about we this did. <laughs> uh i'm greet- sorry salutations <laughs> friends and enemies alike um my name is zachary alexander peeper first of his name spinner and spitter of fire uh tamer of wolves and writer of good fucking books <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes awesome um oh, so when did you start when did i start writing start in writing. general or that book or a little be more a little sp- specific a little more specific um yes because specificity or else we get things we don't watch but oh um, <laughs> but if um when did you start writing in general in general Mm -hmm. um i ooh, i mean actually if we if we're if we're going all the way back (laughs) how far back in time are we traveling (laughs) so um i actually my (laughs) the first book i ever wrote i was like seven okay and i started writing down just couple short little like three or four line stories Mm -hmm. and I made this little construction paper binder notebook uh, when I tied it together with like craft string and I was like seven and I called it the Zach files and that was a very short-lived project I think I had two pages (laughs) I think I had two pages with a couple lines of them uh but I've always I've always loved storytelling I used to uh (laughs) <laughs> when yeah. I was a kid, my, instead of my dad telling me a story at bedtime, I would tell my, he would, he would lay, I would get tucked in and I'd tell my dad a story. Oh. Like, all right, Zach, what story are you telling me? And I would just come <laughs> up with a story on the spot. Like, and that's the story that he's like, all right, son, yeah. good night. And I'd be like, good night. And then, um, in high school is, I, is when I actually, actually started kind of getting serious about writing down um, anything. And that was poetry. Uh-huh. And most of, thankfully, most of that poetry is lost the ether. I have no <laughs> idea what happened. To it. That's probably for the best. Dreadfully, dreadfully mundane and edgy <laughs> was that poetry, if you could even call it that. Um, and then um, I've done poetry on and off uh-huh. my entire adulthood uh as kind of a way of expressing myself and working through various things because you know we all have um we all have feels that we got to work through sometimes yeah. and poetry is one of the you ways i can do leash. that uh and then the the real the real answer to that question when i started writing that book which is really when i decided you know what writing mm-hmm. fuck yeah writing yeah uh, that would be the answer to that would be the winter of 2018 i started writing that and i got done with it winter of 2019 
So it took you a year. Not quite, not quite a year. It took me about 10 months. Uh-huh. And um, is there any particular reason why it took you that short of an amount of time or? Well, the, yeah, the reason I got it done so fast was because <clears throat> uh, I'll go into detail if you want, but uh, the, the short, sweet answer is um, I was writing to distract myself from the most traumatic life event I've ever had. And so I, I was writing to avoid thinking about that and to yeah. process it and to uh-huh. avoid killing myself. Right. <laughs> if I'm just, if I'm being brutally honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I would definitely say that that um, writing is certainly a cathartic experience, especially when dealing with any kind of trauma. Um, yeah. I mean, like from my perspective, I, you know, I went through like, you know, a horrendous, what we could call a mystery illness because they still don't know what, you know, the hell it was. And um, basically my body was trying to kill me and they wouldn't know why until I wasn't in it anymore. (laughs) Yeah. That is no bueno. Yeah. So, you know, when, you know, coming out of that though, but all of the experience I've had from that has definitely added to, you know, writing material. Um, Mm -hmm. Would you say the same about the experience that you had? Oh, 100%. 100%. Um, Here's, here's something that uh, they don't teach in schools and they really should because this is kind of a principle of life Uh that my father was thankfully wise enough to teach me and that uh, should be taught to everyone because it's true. The more life experience you have doing anything or just living life, going through life, the more you can interconnect and learn from other experiences as they relate to other experiences. It's all a web that it's your job to weave it together in a meaningful and useful way. And the more living you do, the more web you have and the more connections you can make. And my traumatic experience that I started writing this book because of it it was, I lost, I lost a relationship that I really, I thought she was the one I wanted to marry. I proposed and I love that girl. Yeah. Uh, And so when I lost that, um, like I said, it was truly, it was truly the most traumatic experience of my life. Mm -hmm. And when you have something like that happen to you, Mm -hmm. you have to find a way through it. Mm -hmm. You have to do something with all of that, with, with all of that emotion. Mm. And there you can, you can process it. Mm-hmm. You can ignore it and you can suffer through it and just kind of wait for it to go away. Yeah. Uh, and the fastest and healthiest way to get through any emotion is to go through it, to process it, mm-hmm. to work through it. And so that's what my writing is about. Um, fundamentally at its base, I am working through horrendous things that have happened yeah. to me. Yeah. And all life is, uh, you know, when you're an artist, Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to, to circle back full circle to your question. Yeah. When you're an artist, fundamentally, your art is about things you've experienced. Mm-hmm. Whether it's something you've experienced personally or a secondhand account or something that you can imagine experiencing because you've had enough life experience to accurately or creatively imagine it. When we create art, we're expressing something mm-hmm. and the point of the expression is to try to share that experience with other people yeah. in a way that is meaningful and helpful. Mm-hmm. I truly believe that's why art in any medium, whether it's music, painting, poetry, dance, doesn't matter. We're trying to express mm-hmm. and share understanding. Yeah. And that's what I, I think that's what is the most beautiful thing about yeah. art. Yeah. And yeah. Because I mean, you know, I, I think one of the greatest, you know, fundamentals of storytelling to add into that is the ability to understand yourself and others as best as you are able. Right. And the fact that creating art allows you to do that, I find that to be the most 
meaningful and worthwhile work you'll probably ever do anything that puts you into that vein so um would would you say that is your leading motivation that keeps you going my not quite so my leading motivation is actually a little bit selfish okay um my my leading motivation that's you know that's my philosophy around mm -hmm. art but my leading motivation for actually doing it is to send a message mm -hmm. and it's i mean it's a selfish message but mm -hmm. uh the message is i love you yeah you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh i don't want to go into the gory details yeah. for various reasons right but uh at the end of it i feel like she walked away thinking that i didn't love her mm -hmm. and that will not be allowed to stand right yeah <laughs> because i loved her more than anything anything yeah truly mm -hmm. more than life itself yeah and that is what this book is a testament to this yeah. is a 149,000 word yeah, or monument monument to I love you and and so is the sequel the mm -hmm. garden of hope which is yeah. uh the the rough draft is done sitting on my computer awaiting editing yes. once the once the launch of garden of lies is wrapped yeah. up I begin yeah. the hardcore editing that garden of hope needs and that's May 14th right uh, May 17th May 17th yeah when are we um <laughs> so yeah would would you definitely say that um to do that you know you said it's a message of i love you would you agree that to love is probably the most dangerous thing anyone could ever do i'm not sure if i would use the word dangerous um to love to love is to sacrifice mm -hmm. A lot of people, so here's, here's something that you learn when you become a truly realized, emotionally mature, mentally mature adult. Mm -hmm. Love is not a feeling. No. Love is not butterflies in your stomach. Love is not an, uh, a desire for someone. Love is a choice. Yeah. Fundamentally, love is choosing every day to work, mm -hmm. to build life with someone else, mm -hmm. to make sure that person has what they need, to form a strong bond and to push through the difficulties of life together. Yeah. That's fundamentally what love is. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and obviously to do that, you have to be willing to make some level of sacrifice. Yeah. You shouldn't be willing to compromise your core values and who you are as a person, but mm -hmm. you should be willing to sacrifice your time, mm -hmm. your effort, your emotional energy, um, small, you know, the degrees of comfort that you can sacrifice without compromising your core values and your core essence as a person. That's what love is. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's, um, what well, you use the word destructive, uh, dangerous, but dangerous. you say ferocious would probably be a more applicable word. Oh yeah. It, it is, it is absolutely a ferocious act because to love, you must be brave. To truly love someone, you must be brave and willing to suffer. Yes. <laughs> because to truly love someone, I mean, it's gonna, they're going to be good times. Oh, yeah. That's, it, to, to love someone and to truly share love with someone is a blessed, holy thing that is truly the only thing that is truly worth having. But it, is, it comes with some suffering. Yes. And so, yes, you must be brave and you must be fierce and you got to have a little bit of a thick skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you say that having that core philosophy, um, a, and I mean, obviously from having read your book and the way that it sort of read in a classical sort of way, I felt almost transported to like when I read Dickens or <laughs> don't, don't, don't cry it's okay <laughs> oh no i i'm grateful you that is truly a high praise i mean i don't personally i think charles dickens is a little bit of a long-winded well, uh likes yeah, but, to hear himself kind of character whereas yeah, i i mean as far as like classical sort of tone would be yeah i 
well, is that the end of your question or you just want my thoughts on that? Well, yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. So you think applying that. Philosophy yeah. Uh, yeah. That. I think, I think that. So to circle back to what I said about my whole philosophy around writing yes. and how it's to share experience and to share um, purpose and, and all that stuff. Yeah. When you have that kind of an evolved philosophy around your writing, and I, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant or conceited or no. anything. This is just how I, I'm just hey, being real. Hey, get intellectually naked. It is I'm just being fun. real. Uh, so yeah, when you have that kind of evolved and thought out and really actualized thought process around your writing, and you and that's and it comes from a real place, a real wealth of emotional and lived experience. I'm 27, so I'm not some old sage, but I've done a fair bit of living in my right. life. Yeah, I've done, I've had quite a fair bit of living. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to go over my life story, but just take my word for it. Yes. I've yeah. seen and done some yeah. shit. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, if you read my writing, you can tell. Yes, it shows. It really, <laughs> really does. So... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a product of that. It's, you can't, I couldn't, I couldn't dumb myself down to the level of, and I'm not, this isn't a personal insult against right. the writer. Yeah. I'm just saying I couldn't dumb myself down to the level of writing in 50 shades of gay. 50 shades of gay. Yeah. I, I just said gay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, that was a Freudian slip. I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. No, no hate towards the LGBT community. I promise. Freudian slip. That is perfect. <laughs> Someone has to write that novel now. Someone has to write Ray esque romance between two. Oh that would be hilarious. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was watching this podcast and this guy made a Freudian slip and I just ran with it, man. I ran with it. Write that novel, oh, humble God. viewer. I will oh, buy God. it. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I don't know about them. Well, would they do the same as she did though and write it on a, a roll of toilet paper? And oh God. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I do not know. But um, I think that would be uh, humbly, <laughs> humbly thematically fitting, considering, uh, you know, it's a gay relationship. And um, <laughs> that stuff. again, no hate towards the gays is just, no, but just facts. facts. <laughs> but anyway, As God, that say, went off the rails quick. Wow. I'm sorry. I have a That's, I have a gutter yeah, on hey, all sides of my mind and I okay. easily slip into it. <laughs> Um, that is okay. Yeah, my philosophy. Yes. Yeah. So, the 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 fact that my writing um, has such a high level of emotion mm -hmm. and 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 is at times so elevated, yeah. it's because I have this wealth of experience mm -hmm. and I draw on it, and because of that, it naturally rises to the, that level. And I don't know Stephanie Myers personally, and I don't even know the person who wrote, I can't, I don't know the name of the person who wrote 50 Shades of Grey. Um, E.L. James. I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, what was it? E.L. James. E.L. Oh, hmm. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, but I don't know real what name, were, but like, yeah. And I don't know how emotionally deep those two people are, mm -hmm. but I can speak for myself and say, I am emotionally deep. Uh, and I, and I actually have the genes to back it up. Fun mm -hmm. little fact about me, just as a quick little aside, yeah. I recently did a genome mapping service, Nebula yeah. Genetics, and they take your gene and they fully map out your genome. Um, whereas a oh. lot of places like 23andMe, mm -hmm. they just do the kind of a bare bones like analysis your to trace yeah. your family history. Mm -hmm. The one I did does a full genome map. They oh. literally look at every little bit of your DNA. And one of the things I found out from that yeah. is I have a gene that's associated with increased brain volume, yeah. which means there's more space on the inside of my brain, which means I have more chemical receptors, which literally means I feel <laughs> emotions more profoundly than the average Joe. It's a very yeah. rare gene, actually, like 1% of the people that have used that service, they, they say, so many percent of this people that use our service have this gene. 1% mm. of the people who get that service done have that yeah. gene. Very rare. And I frankly, I think it's the 
I think it's the poet gene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it's the same gene that uh, people like Poe and, mm -hmm. and uh, Robert Frost yes. tend to have yeah. because we feel things so profoundly mm -hmm. and we, we get hit with emotions so hard and it just allows us to sink into them and we really have to think about them and process them. And at, at, at a certain point, the art and the poetry and the, and the creating and expressing yourself becomes more of a necessity than certain other things that you typically think of as a need, like social interaction or stuff right. like that. Yeah. <clears throat> because, uh, we need a more complex and evolved way of expressing ourselves to get that stuff out. Yeah. And that is what my writing is a product of because like you said, it's, um, it's, 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 I, I, you said Dickens, I actually had another, uh, someone who left me, she's the first review on my Goodreads, Jean Talbert, whose work I've reviewed on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. She used the, she used the, um, phrase Shakespearean dialogue yes to yes. describe some of my sections of dialogue yeah. I got barred bar vibes yeah and barred it was and I took yeah. that I took that as truly high praise because in the same sentence she this was she, she it was in the criticism part of her her private review to me mm -hmm. she said um it's very interesting how some of your dialogue is very crass and blunt and some of it is shakespearean and i said yeah. well that's exactly that's exactly what i wanted to hear because that's exactly how i meant it to be yes. <laughs> because look life is like that yeah life exactly. should be like that sometimes you need to be shakespearean and sometimes you need to be blunt exactly yeah, yeah. so that's 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 why and uh it's very much a deliberate choice mm -hmm. and, and thank you for that high praise <laughs> yeah hey no problem i mean and i think another part of why i picked up on that and you sort of confirmed that for me by going into talking about your genetics actually um because I which is which is i just i'm sorry i interrupted you i apologize no you are okay habit. go right but, ahead uh, uh, yeah, I like I said, I recently found that out. And when I saw that on my gene report, I was like, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, another thing that I actually figured out about myself um, as, you know, sort of coming back from the dead and, you know, they don't make instruction manuals for that. So I have, mm -hmm. you know, might fix that. Don't know. But um, I've figured out that I'm actually wired for um do you know what synesthesia is Syn uh, I, I I've heard it pronounced synesthesia mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah I funny enough I actually have a best friend who has that she like tastes colors and like feels mm -hmm. sounds yeah yeah and so and come to find out there's actually they say that only a very small percentage of people have it but really mm -hmm there's a lot more people that have it because it's just not something that's talked about and people just think that they're weird. Right. And they came to found, find out through researching, and I mean, this may just strictly be academic, but at least 80% of classical artists had some form of it or another. And, and I assume that's, uh, that's conjecture based on what they've written about and they're studying the person's life. Yeah. And that the fact is, that they're able to, you know, actually yeah. describe what, you know, how a yeah. color that's could sound. I buy it. Yeah. I you buy know. that a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you know, because yep. like, you know, the smell of fear, most people right. wouldn't understand what that is unless, I mean, but I personally do. Because right. I can walk into a room and I under, you know, I can read the vibes in the room based on the different right sense signatures that are going on. And that's that's a little bit different than what I have. I don't think I have any version of synesthesia, but what mm -hmm. I do have is like I said, that very deep emotional mm -hmm. reservoir. And I also have a very good mind for critical and abstract analysis. Mm -hmm. And so when someone like, like you describing the scent of fear, I'm able to reach for various things I've experienced mm -hmm. and various smells. And I'm able to 
draw very complex thought patterns through my experiences and make connections like that. Um, so yeah, and and that's again going back to an earlier question. That's one of the that's another one of the beautiful things about art is we can take these complex ideas or abstract ideas and we can make them more relatable to people who don't have these mm -hmm. ways of these these neurodivergent yeah. abilities and we make it more relatable to more people and again increase human understanding which is yeah. what i think art is fundamentally about is increasing human understanding yeah the ability to be able to understand yourself and others to mm -hmm. reiterate that point and give people an actual ability to love themselves as well as other people yes um so do you think by understanding how differently you're wired than other people and you know i as well would you say that creativity is something that comes in people's wiring yes and no um i definitely think I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. Okay. I, I definitely believe that creativity is some combination of nature and nurture. Okay. There's people who are born in, use me as a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I'm a mechanic's son. Okay. My dad tried to pull me out to the garage all the time to work on cars. Yeah. My mom was a seamstress. Mm -hmm. I was uh, never, I was never pushed into anything creative by my parents. Um, when I expressed interest in it, they were supportive and they were 100% on board with me doing it. Thankfully, yeah. I, I have, I'm lucky in that way that I have supportive parents, but I was never encouraged or pushed to it. I gravitated towards it naturally. That is 100% my nature, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. is, I have these genes that drive me to express myself, that allow me to think in very abstract things, that allow me to think in very abstract ways. And yeah. so I naturally gravitate towards creativity. Um, whereas there might be people who are born into a hyper-creative family mm -hmm. who don't have any of those genes, yeah. but they're surrounded by creative thinking and abstract thinking. And so it just is becomes ingrained in them. Mm -hmm. And that's two sides that, that that's the opposite sides of the creative process that can bring someone to being a creative, right? We, you, yeah. we use that word to describe people. They're a creative. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think both of those routes are possible ventures are, are possible routes to becoming a creative. Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, I'd say it's probably a, some combination of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and to, and to give a hard, concrete answer to your question, uh, I think anyone can be a creative, mm -hmm. but I think it's definitely much harder for some people to become a creative and especially an interesting one, mm -hmm. because here's the hard facts. Here, here's what a lot of people aren't willing to talk about. And this is not, be, not, not to be a dick, but this is just life. Right. You might write a hundred books and none of them are going to be worth anything. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's just reality. You might create 10,000 paintings and all of them suck. Right. I'm sorry. That's just life. Yeah. And uh, you know, just because you create something doesn't mean you're good at creating right. things. And yeah. that's where, that's where the process of trying to engage your human ability to learn and adapt and grow comes in. Mm -hmm. And you can either say to yourself, well, why does my art suck? And try to pull cr collective criticism mm -hmm. and learn from your constructive and non-constructive criticisms and really try to hone in on how to make it better. Mm -hmm. Or you can s stay in your rut and ignore people and keep sucking. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that, would you agree that, um, and I'm, I'm going to reference magicians here, but um, how Elliot talked about the fact that magic doesn't come from talent, it comes from pain. And I mean, I personally think that that's a yes and no, because it's the talent paid to you in compensation for all the blood and flesh that you sacrifice to get where you are. Would you concur? Sorry, what? 
Bless you. I had to burp there for a moment. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> to uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say yes and no to that too. And and here's why. Mm -hmm. Um, not all talent comes from pain. Mm -hmm. Not all inspiration comes from pain. Mm -hmm. I've created like I I have a lot of poetry sitting on my computer right now that I've written to express the miserable state I'm in. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also have a few poems on my computer and on my if you can if you can find it I, there's a website where people post poetry and and I have some stuff on there. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, you're, but I'm not going to tell you you're going to have to go hunting for yes, it. That's people are going to have to go hunting for it. <laughs> Um, but uh, a lot of it I've created because I was inspired by something beautiful, namely love. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think talent and inspiration can come from anything that's potent enough mm -hmm. to, to instill that, to put it in us. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you're talking about a practical skill, like, like being a magician, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm then it's much more applicable in a practical sense mm -hmm. because you have to spend the time actually learning the skills. Sleight of hand is an acquired skill. Yeah. And you know, some of the some of the things that go into sleight of hand, there's a learning curve that quite literally could be painful. You might damage your fingers, your wrists, you might physically hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially when you get into more complex things like being an escape artist, you could very easily kill yeah. yourself <laughs> learning some of the stunts that the greats of magic have learned and, yeah. and routinely did. Yeah. Because it's crafty shit that takes a high level of skill. Yeah. So it depends on, you know, it, it, it's a case by case thing sometimes, but as a general rule, uh, it, as a general rule, pain and suffering are great fuel for talent and inspiration yeah if you if you suffer through and and make your suffering guided if there's a purpose to it mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you would definitely say that literature is converting blood into ink <laughs> there's definitely a high aspect of that yeah like i mean like i i make no secret about it uh earlier and mm -hmm. on this discussion and i i in my interview with patricia simpson on my own channel and just kind of if you read between the lines in various videos on my channel yeah yeah my 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 creation of this beautiful work of art uh not to not to stroke my own ego too much but yeah <laughs> this is this is my pain polished to a marble shine yeah. This is my suffering polished to the most beautiful thing it can possibly become. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think that with the way that American publishing has become, I would say rigid in a way where they like to put people in boxes because mm -hmm. they're so concerned about, you know, branding and even though you know and George R. R. Martin has even talked about this about how you know if you publish yourself as a writer and you write in a particular genre basically publishing paints you as not being able to diversify your storytelling do you think that people should be allowed to work in whatever vein of storytelling they want to or yes yes i do um i i'm i'm gonna say it bluntly yeah fuck gatekeepers <laughs> right <laughs> fuck typecasting mm -hmm. fuck putting me in any kind of creative box um some people are comfortable being typecasted because they don't want to do anything else like you look at jim carrey 90 percent of his work He's the wacky, zany, funny guy, which, right. by the way, early on, his personality in movies inspired a lot of my own personality. I loved his <laughs> movies as a kid. The Mask is a work of art. Yes, and it is. I based at least 20% of my personality <laughs> on it. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a place for that. And it's okay when, when a creative is fine doing that. Mm -hmm. But then you look at an actor like, uh, why am I spacing on his name? He did. He was Batman, the guy from The Machinist. 
Um, uh, uh, not, um, not not Bruce Nolan. He directed it. Um, um, God damn it! You talking about Michael Keaton or Christian Bale? Christian Bale. <laughs> thank you. You look at an actor like Christian Bale. His range is so huge. Yes. He is such a good actor and mm-hmm. he takes his art so seriously. He commits. Yeah. I, I, I consider myself a bit of an actor. I've, I have an IMDB credit. I've been on, I was on stage all through high school. Yeah. I will never be as good of an actor as him because <laughs> no. I'm not willing to destroy and abuse my body for my, for my acting the way he is. That guy is a true, I know. He's he committed. is a master of the craft of yeah. art of, of acting. That guy is a phenomenal actor. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, he absolutely blows out of the water any idea that an artist has to be typecast and has to be put in a box because he proves beyond a shadow of a doubt someone who's good at art mm-hmm. and someone who's mastered the craft of their particular art can do whatever the fuck they want with their art. Yeah. Um, these books that and following in the same vein, I'm not that good of an actor, but I like to think I am that good of a writer and I'm going to prove it. These are epic fantasy novels. The Garden Saga is three epic fantasies. Mm -hmm. When I'm done with this, I'm writing a sci-fi thriller mystery. That's the next one after this. After this. And I have the general plot and and storyline in my head and it's going to be in a very abstract format. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I, yeah, do I, uh, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. Let, okay. Let, you're, not, you're, happens. you're not going to, it, I'm not going to spoil, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, like I said, I, I have a very good idea of how I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to, it's going to take a little bit of fine tuning on the execution. Cause it's very mm-hmm. different than the first person present tense that I'm writing yeah. in here. Yes. But, but I know how I'm going to do it and mm-hmm. it's going to be very fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> do you um now uh that brings me to my next point actually um you mentioned how you were in theater and i know that i myself also was in theater a good bit through high school and some of my 20s um and i've been able to apply that to especially as being a ghostwriter for the last 16 years being able to do other people's voices on paper has that aided your ability to perform as and i know the book is written in first person present tense do you think that being on stage and having to transform into other characters made that easier yeah absolutely like i said earlier you know the more experience you have and the more things you can draw from to interconnect and flesh out your web that is your psyche, yeah. the, more, uh, the, the more realized you become as a person and the more realized you can become in whatever profession or p- personal pastime or goal you have, right? And so perfect example is uh, it's, it's almost a one-to-one translation of skill to be quite honest. It's, I don't even have to go that far through my web because over here in the acting, I have to understand character development and I have to, especially character motivation. When you're acting, you have to know why the character you're portraying is doing what they're doing, why they're saying what they're saying so that you can really feel it and make the character come alive. Mm -hmm. No one wants to watch someone rehearse lines. No. That's not fun. (laughs) No. (laughs) You want to see that character alive on the stage fucking pissed Mm -hmm. that their car got stolen yes and the person reacting to that situation as someone really would that's what you want to see when you watch a movie Mm -hmm. watch a tv show go to a play that's what you're paying to see yeah that translates directly to writing Mm -hmm. because i need the same skill of understanding character motivations of getting in ahead other than my own. I mean, technically it's still my own because they're all yeah. a product of my imagination. Right. Yes. My psyche. They're all your brain children. They're all a reflection of me in some way, yeah. but they all are also their own characters and personalities. Yeah. And especially when you're writing the other sex, mm-hmm. it takes a lot of time sitting there and saying, 
how would how would a girl who's interested in a guy but doesn't want to just come right out and say it behave right yeah what kind of mannerisms would she have Mm -hmm. what kind of things would she say yeah and I actually I had to go through that process for two of the characters yeah actually three three actually four four (laughs) characters in my book yeah Uh, and and it was uh it, it was challenging but it was rewarding yeah. And that goes back to that human understanding thing. That's mm-hmm. one of, that's one of the things art is great is helping us understand other humans. Yeah. And I I think that that, you know, that definitely aided me especially when, you know, having to do other people's voices, I had to write for a lot of men. So having to be able to understand that and sort of walk a mile in their shoes, so to speak, you know, aided you know, my ability to be able to put on that persona and on top of having five brothers. So, I mean, you know. Yep. So, um, yep. do you do anything else to create a more immersive experience for yourself writing or can you pretty much write anywhere? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I mean, like, do you need a specific space and specific playlist and specific aesthetics around you? Because no. there are a lot. There, no, there let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. So I started writing this novel sitting right here, although I think it was a different desk at the time. It was I was I was still using <laughs> I was still using a picnic table. I, as my desk, I had a oh, folding wow. shitty plastic picnic table in my room as yeah. my desk because I'm, I in some ways I really am the stereotypical like black bachelor mindset male. Like I don't need something that looks fancy. I don't need it. if it's functional, it's good yes. enough. That's how that's how my mind works. Yeah. Uh, and I just recently got this desk because it was secondhand and going to get thrown away. And I said, well, I will I, rescue it. <laughs> I, I will take this because it's a very. I mean, it's, it's Ikea. So it's like not high quality material, but it looks yeah. nice and it has cubby spaces and counters. And it's nice. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> anyways, so my point is um, I wrote, I wrote the first 10 or so chapters sitting here in this room, in this spot, chugging away most of it in a sleep deprived state, because that's when my creative juices get flowing. And that's when yeah. it's easiest when I'm sleep deprived and the barriers in my psyche begin to fall away because thought, because complex thought constructs like the person I choose to be on a day-to-day basis, those mm-hmm. naturally fall away when you start running out of energy. And so my brain connects in new and interesting ways. And that's a better place for me to create my art. Mm-hmm. That's just a little tidbit about me and how my brain works. Yeah. You go completely subconscious. And uh, so I wrote a lot of it there, but I also wrote a lot of it at work. I worked as a security guard for a large per- portion of when I was writing this book. Yeah. I'd say at least half of it was probably written. I probably got paid to write half of my book. And <laughs> that happened during daylight hours at a medical clinic. Oh. That happened during graveyard hours at a different medical clinic. That happened during daylight and graveyard hours at a warehouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it happened... Uh, on the road a little bit uh, when I took my laptop places to write Um, so and some of it I listened to music some of it I wanted silence some of it I was snacking some of it I wasn't some of it I would sit there chugging away and crank out three chapters in a row I think I did that one time and Mm -hmm. then some of it I would write a sentence pace write a sentence pace (laughs) write a sentence pace work out eat come back and write a few paragraphs <laughs> like, I have no set process mm-hmm. I do I, I I do what I need to do in the moment to make the the writing as good as it needs to be mm-hmm. as so, good as it can be so you would say to all of these people and not to be terribly unsensitive or hurt anyone's feelings but all of these people who are working so hard to curate some kind of an immersive experience for themselves because they think that's what they need to do this would you say that's 
productive procrastination and they just need to just sit down and do it and stop worrying about, you know, creating aesthetic um, boards and playlists. I'm, and I've actually thought about stuff. doing, I've thought about doing a whole video on this um, because A, it's a common thing for author tubers to do that video. Yeah. Because again, increasing human understanding, sharing experience, increasing the wealth of mm -hmm. uh, information in the conversation. Uh, but yeah, I'll touch on it uh, right now too. Okay. So when you, it is a form of procrastination mm -hmm. and you really have to be self-aware and use a little bit of self-analysis. This is a skill all adults should have. It should be taught in school and it's yeah. not, it's criminal. <laughs> it's not. I'm serious. It's, it's pathetic. This, that common. this was, this was taught to young men and, and women for that matter. Yeah. All throughout early human civilization, it was a high virtue in Greece, the yeah. ability to self-analyze and look inward and apply reason and logic to what you're feeling and how you behave. Yeah. It's a valuable and important skill. And it's it, at this point, it's a Renaissance art because it's not taught anymore. And it yeah. should be, it yeah. would solve most of this most country. Of the, yes. Sorry, I'm, just, I'm getting off on a tangent here because I'm very passionate about it. I'm very angry about the state of my country because I love my country. I know. Anyways. Yes. Be intellectually naked, I don't care. To get to your question. Yeah. <laughs> you, if you need some, it's okay. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to order this. Okay. So it's concise, but clear. Yeah. If you need something to get in the zone, mm -hmm. then put yourself in that circumstance. If you need music, listen to music. Mm -hmm. If you need to have a snack next to you because your brain uses more calories than the average person and you yeah. can't let your blood sugar dip below so much level. Yeah have some chips next to you but there gets to a point where it becomes procrastination mm -hmm. where you're getting so tied up in trying to create the ideal situation to be creative that you're getting to be entirely counterproductive mm -hmm. you need to look at what you're doing and say Am I actually doing something that's feeding my art, that's feeding my creativity, that's helping me be productive, or am I procrastinating uh -huh. because this is more fun and much easier and gives me a more instant dopamine hit than sitting down and chugging away at my novel mm -hmm. or at my poetry or at my songs or whatever you're doing? Yeah. You have to self-analyze and find where that line is for you. Mm -hmm. I happen to be, I think I'm somewhat creatively rare in that I can literally just sit down. And if, 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 if I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I haven't written anything in like 10 days, I need to sit down and stop being a dumbass and write. I yeah. can walk from my bathroom to my chair in any condition, whether I've eaten or not, whether there's music or not, whether there's yelling somewhere else in my house or not, mm -hmm. and start writing. Yeah. Because I, and, and again, that, that is something I think comes from the fact that I'm a very realized writer and I have a very good idea what my world looks like and what my characters look like and what the tone and theme and all that stuff is. It's so ingrained that it's, it's automatic. Yeah. So for some people I get, it's harder to reach for that because you have to spend more time building it and, and realizing it in your head. And so you need fewer distractions. Mm -hmm. Um, but Again, you have to look at you have to look at the threshold. Am I am I getting to the point where now I'm in the zone and I can think and realize my art, or am I procrastinating because because I don't actually want to produce my art? <laughs> right. You, you have to self analyze. Mm -hmm. So, government of oneself is self government. Is, again, that's one of those found. The, the founding fathers and many great philosophers have talked about self-government and it is a, a, and you know, you learn it in martial arts, mm -hmm. you learn it in any kind of serious discipline, like math, like being a master chef, mm -hmm. being a master musician. Anytime you try to reach the pinnacle of something, Olympic yeah. athletes, self-government becomes a fundamental skill to that. Yeah. And everyone should be taught at least the core tenets of self-government because yeah. it is one of the single most useful skills you can possibly have. Yeah. And by the way, not to, I don't, 
Do not think for a second that I'm sitting here and preaching from on high. I suck at it. I suck at self-government. I am one of the most radically out of control people I know. I just so happen to be very good at creating. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I mean, because I I honestly, I mean, for being as, you know, I guess you could call it organized as I am, I would definitely say that. I'm somewhat self-governed, but you know. Yeah, I try to be. I'm just. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to anyone. I'm not good at it, but yeah. I try to be. It's it's yeah. something I strive to. Mm-hmm. Um. So, do you think that? Um, and this brings me to another issue that uh, a lot of writers use for productive procrastination, or sometimes they genuinely feel like they have this writer's block do you at all ever struggle with that especially writing epic fantasy a lot of the time it's called the marathon in the middle do you (laughs) do you get stuck with that and what if anything do you do to bring out the creative c4 and so past that um I've had, I think I had during the process of writing the Garden of Lies, I had one period where I had a, 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 an episode of what you could call writer's block. Okay. And it lasted maybe, maybe a week or two. And it, it was, a, it's a combination of, it was a combination of things for me. I was particularly impacted by my trauma that time period and I was struggling with where I wanted to go in the story. I had a general outline. I'm kind of a hybrid between an engineer and a gardener. Um, I had a general idea of where I wanted to go, but there were so many other ways I could take it. And I was having trouble nailing something down and I was struggling. And finally, I says to myself, I says, well, I'm too far. I, I can't scrap this book. Yeah. It's, at that point, I'd, I'd share chapters with my dad all through its creation, which is something he talks about in his foreword. Mm-hmm. And um, it, I says to myself, this is too good to not finish. I have to, I, I got to commit to this. Too far in to die now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I had a general outline. Mm-hmm. And so I sat down and I, did the self introspection, I did a little bit of self governance. And I really sat down and looked myself in, in the metaphorical psychological mirror. Yeah. And I said, what's best for the story? What will make the most compelling story? Do you want to write what you want to write? Or do you want to make a little bit of self sacrifice on what you want and write what's going to make a really good fucking story? Right. And I weighed pros and cons and I came to a decision and I broke through my writer's block. Mm -hmm. Um, I think more often than not, I think writer's block is an illusion. Yeah. And it's, you know, we all create illusions for ourselves to one degree or another. They're called cognitive distortions. Mm -hmm. They're improper thought patterns that um, if, if you if you have a lot of problems in your life, you might want to go to the therapist and have them work with you on unraveling your cognitive distortions. Yeah. Very useful. You, it's a very good use of your time. Trust me as someone who's been to a lot of therapy. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, do it. <laughs> this is why I but, uh, sleep is for pussies and dead people because your mind will put you in this sort of dream state you know, that things are, you know, a certain way and they really aren't. Right. Exactly. We get, uh, we get caught up, we get caught up in thought patterns. We get caught up in chemical hijacks where we've, we've been through this path of behavior or this thought pattern so many times that the second we, uh, uh, one of our, one of our psychological feet takes one step down that path. And then it's like, we're propelled down that path by a catapult and we can't stop ourselves that's the kind of stuff that locks people into destructive behavior or or behavior that's non non Mm non-beneficial not necessarily destructive but just non-beneficial and those are the kinds of things that therapists they can teach you how to if you start taking that step they can teach you how to stop and say oh i'm about to get sucked into that that chemical hijack of 
useless or destructive behavior, yeah. I need to step back. Right. And that's, that's again, therapy is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, so writer's block is for most people, I would say that's what it is. Uh-huh. It's that it's that repeating thought pattern. For some people, it's anxiety about their work. Oh, why am I even writing? My work isn't that good anyways. Uh-huh. Or it's, uh, you know, they, they have these other behaviors in their life that um, give them dopamine hits. And that's their chemical hijack is they, they would write, but they sat down and binge watched another Netflix show. Right. And so it's like, do you have writer's block or are you being chemically hijacked Mm -hmm. and you can't help yourself from doing other things? Yeah. Um, Or I would say the, I would say the only true legitimate writer's block is when you're serious about your art Mm -hmm. and you know where it's going and you have a good idea of what you want to do with it. And then you come to one thing or, or a section Mm -hmm. where you're like, don't know what to put here. I don't know how to bridge this gap from event A to event B. Mm-hmm. It needs to be good. It needs to be compelling. And I don't know how to do that. That is a genuine moment of, uh, of creative challenge. Mm-hmm. And those are the times where you need to engage in some creative nurturing for yourself. Mm-hmm. Listen, to, listen to music, read poetry, read mm-hmm. other people's work, um, watch high quality movies, don't sit yeah. down and watch a bunch of, uh, I'm not going to name a specific not- movie. <laughs> don't, don't sit down and watch a bunch of garbage movies. Sit right. down and watch some thinking piece movies. Yes. And that kind of consumption of art and, um, and human experience will help you and it will feed you ideas and material to work your way through that block. Yeah, which uh, actually brings me to another point. Um, Gosh, you are so good at conversation. Um, oh, well, thank you. I try. <laughs> but uh, the um, what would what does your mental diet consist of, really, when you are feeding your brain creative brain food? Like, who do you read? Um, who do you, so um, in particular. I actually don't do nearly as much reading as I should. Um, I've got an entire, I've got an entire stack of books over here Uh that I need to start on. Um, They're kind of been pushed by the side to allow me to, um, again, uh, finish the process of releasing this. Uh, I'm trying to get better at at reading stuff that I should be reading. Um, uh, And in terms of stuff that isn't uh the written word Uh um really i consume a lot of music and i consume a (laughs) and this might sound stupid but bear with me because there's there's a method to my madness here okay i consume a lot of internet culture okay and i consume a lot of music okay and and i and i said music already uh, and i consume a lot of anime and and well and so music self-explanatory and again and i am going to call names on this one don't listen to cardi b (laughs) if you're trying to feed your brain don't listen to wap it's banal and (laughs) useless for thinking right stop it it doesn't work the correct section of your brain correct it's it's a it is a self-indulgent dopamine gorging it is not meaningful productive music if you want meaningful meaningful productive music go to the likes of mozart uh-huh. and if you want something that's more modern but still meaningful yeah. classic rock there's a lot yeah. of great meaningful lyrics yeah. in classic rock i do music mondays on my channel and, yeah. and break down lyrics uh, and it, and even even modern bands like uh if you if you're interested in heavier stuff and you can really look for meaning in lyrics to a heavy angry background Uh i'm gonna sound a little bit silly but i analyze the lyrics i challenge you to to do that and okay and uh see if i'm bullshitting you five finger death punch disturbed metallica Uh lincoln park yeah these are bands that have hard-hitting emotional thought lyrics 
And just because they scream them at you doesn't mean they aren't saying something profound. Breaking Benjamin. Oh, Breaking Ben. Oh my God. Masterpiece. Yeah. Masterpieces of creative, Mm -hmm. soulful diary of Jane. Yeah. Dance with the devil. Mm -hmm. Breathe. Breathe your life into me. I fucking love Breaking (laughs) Ben. Yes. I will try to find my place in the diary of Jane. So tell me. God, you got me. Yeah, I'm not, I love I'm, it. I, I fucking love Breaking Bed. Yes, I'm going to have to do it. Yep, that's the next Music Monday. I'm, pick, I'm picking yes. it. Yep, that's yeah. the next Music Monday. So, <laughs> and you have a really good voice, by the way. I got an award for singing. What? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, it's Oh, it's not hanging up there. Yeah, there's a international... It's called the International Model Talent Association, IMTA. They hold they hold an annual competition. I went there, got fourth place, on uh, on my category of singing. Yeah. it was very fun, and I I was a little bit mad that I didn't get uh, right. <laughs> that I didn't place in the top three. Yeah, uh, I I actually didn't place in the top three because like everything else in our society, it's partially a popularity Popular and contest. appearance contest. Mm-hmm. And they said my voice did not fit the outward image that I, you know, I, they said, I, I got up there and I sang uh, a fairly soulful acapella rendition of um, uh, Fix Me by 10 mm-hmm. Years. 10 Years yeah. is another good band. They're kind yeah. of on the, they're kind of underground, but if you've never yeah. heard of them, go listen to them fantastic yeah. poetic lyrics yes fantastic huh. but uh i'm your sorry sound, your playlist sounds a lot like mine oh good shit <laughs> <laughs> but uh yes i'm sorry i got i got so far off the rails here no, that is okay. I, I, you asked me about my, what i feed my brain creatively so yeah. music obviously yeah. we just had a whole section about that yeah. moving on now internet culture uh-huh there is so one of the beautiful things about memes uh-huh. is that they are a simplified, dumbed down, hyper, hyper childish and base expression uh-huh. of more complex emotions and more complex things that are happening in society and the, our collective culture consciousness. Yeah. So you take a meme like, uh, like the shooting stars meme. Uh-huh. And <laughs> on its face, it's so simple. It's just a collection of uh, people doing silly things to a backdrop of music and going through the cosmos. And on its face, it's just silly, basic humor. Yeah. But then you look at, if you start overthinking it, and analyzing what kind of clips people are putting to the meme, mm-hmm. you begin getting an idea of what we collectively as a society think is funny. Right. And it allows you to take the pulse of society yeah. in terms of what people think is funny mm-hmm. and what we elevate to the top of our um, dialogue wh- where humor is concerned. Mm-hmm. And it's a great way of gauging your fellow man and how he perceives humor. Yeah. And that is one of the th- great things about memes. If you read my work yeah. and you anal- and you overthink it, analyze it a little bit, you'll see the memes. Yes. They're in there. <laughs> I love meme culture. I'm a meme lord. I'm a professor in memeology and memeronomy. I love right. memes. Well, and now that you're to be published, you can get tenure in. Uh, I oh, have. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, sir, I'm a pro- I am a tenured professor in meteorology. Yes. <laughs> Fuck off with your Philistine self. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to be the most conceited, ridiculous 50-year-old man. Yep. I'm about to get to the end of life and be like, "Listen, Sonny, right. you don't know shit about meteorology." <laughs> <laughs> you should be like you just get yourself a t-shirt that says, call me. Even see the Pepe the Frog? <laughs> do, you, do you even know you even what know? Courage Wolf is? <laughs> How about Insanity Wolf, you <laughs> little shit? 
Can you tell me the difference between Eric between between Courage Wolf and Insanity oh, Wolf? <laughs> I bet you can. I bet you can. Stupid <laughs> bastards. <laughs> Fuck. Oh my god. Oh my that's god. the two sides of my psyche, by the way. Courage Wolf yeah. and Insanity Wolf. <laughs> That's the that's not, that's how my brain operates. Just by the way, not a bad uh, combination. Like I said, mad is an unword. They're just varying levels uh, of sanity. Oh God, I fucking uh, I love memes. So yeah. yeah, so if you um if you consume them properly and uh-huh. think about them properly, and uh, really apply some critical thinking, things that are banal and seemingly uh-huh. meaningless. Yeah, can can be more can be valuable brain yeah. fodder. Yeah, you can realchemize them to be useful. Yep, you can re you can repurpose them and yeah. really look for look at the greater the message that you can get from them. Yeah. Um. And then anime, I listed mm-hmm. that too. So here's the thing about anime: it's not fucking cartoons for children. No, it's a not. lot of people. <laughs> Like you hear, you go on Twitter and you look at, um, like, I'm sorry, I need a drink of water. Sorry. Like you see these, uh, you, it's usually women, not to, not to bag on the female sex Uh is just, that's a, just a matter of fact. It usually is women. And they, they'll say just thoughtless shit. Like anime is cartoons for kids and only incels watch it. Are you dumb? What? Are, yeah, I've I've seen what? I've seen that tweet, and there's millions of tweets like that live on the internet right now. Oh. And uh, it's go not watch, for children, though. Go watch Psycho Pass and tell me that's for kids. <laughs> right. Go watch Full Metal Alchemist and tell me that's for kids. Exactly. Go watch any serious storytelling anime and oh. tell me that's for children. It's not. These yeah. are. This is a storytelling medium that contains truly the entire wealth of human thought and experience there is an anime for everyone that talks right. about everything everything from surviving horrific events like rape or seeing your family murdered mm-hmm. or having your country destroyed and you're the lone survivor right. to everyday things like how exhausting it can be to go through your day-to-day life with no one to share it with right the entire wealth of human experience is portrayed across the wealth of animes that exist Mm -hmm. it really is just a matter of which ones you watch and people act like dragon ball z is representative of the entire storytelling medium that's not true no it's not so i consume a lot of anime Mm -hmm. i really i'm i'm a full-blown weeb slash otaku whatever word you want to put on it yeah i'm a guy who likes anime and again because there's there's that real deep wealth of human emotion and because it gives you a look at at a culture that's very foreign from our own Mm -hmm. i think in a lot of ways japanese culture is more spiritually evolved than western culture yeah um and they and they have certain ideological tenets and ways of looking at life and the world that are superior to our own for various reasons. Yeah. And and if you doubt that, um, look at some of the great things Japan has going on for it, right. as opposed yeah. to what's going on in Western cultures right now. Yeah. Japan has a stupidly low crime rate. Mm-hmm. Every Western country right now has soaring crime rates. Yeah. Japan has a very strong national identity and they're proud of who they are and no one over there is rallying against the government because they think the government hates them. Yeah. That's literally every Western country right now. Yeah. Clearly the Japanese are doing something right. right. And they, their way of thinking has some serious merits to it. Yeah. And anime gives you a beautiful window mm-hmm. into that way of thinking. Yeah. And that way of analyzing life. Mm-hmm. And more than anything else, the thing I love about anime is it has a sense of romance to it. Yeah. It has, and for those of you who don't know what I mean by that, when I say romance, I don't mean like um, interpersonal relationship, man, right. woman romance. Mm-hmm. Romance as a genre of storytelling mm-hmm. encompasses the idea of having a sense of romance about life. 
yeah i mean a sense of wonder and awe and appreciation for the world around us and a general love of experiencing life that's mm-hmm. what the romance genre used to be that's what romance era writers like mary shelley mm-hmm. thought to encapsulate in their writing and if you read the original frankenstein you yeah. really see what i'm talking about because she pages Mm-hmm. of how beautiful nature is yeah and it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a slog in some ways for a modern yeah. reader but guess what it's also damn good poetic it prose. is and she very shelley was a creative genius she wrote it in 12 hours yeah yeah like i said creative genius yeah um personally i think mary shelley stands stands toe to toe with the likes of Socrates and mm-hmm. Homer and uh, Poe and and Shakespeare. Yeah. Creative genius. I, yes. I cannot stress that enough. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Mentioning Mary Shelley, um, because I, I feel the same way um, as far as like her ferocity for storytelling. Um, and the fact that it was just a because a lot of the classics they just sat down and they did it and they didn't worry about you know oh well this isn't what's trending right now so I'm not gonna you know target myself to this market or you know well do use adverbs don't use adverbs all of that stuff they just sat down and they did it like Jekyll and Hyde was written in three days well actually technically six because his wife burned the first draft after reading it and then he had to sit down and <laughs> write it over again I did not know that <laughs> yes so um would you say that the same ferocity needs to be brought back to storytelling and what if any way do you feel like you're doing that uh so first of all uh, separate from your question you're a little bit quieter I don't know if it's just because the acoustics oh, are different or what possibly I'm sorry thank you, yeah, did you <laughs> My, hear I heard your okay I did hear your question though okay. I just I just want to let you know yeah thank you uh, but uh, to answer your question um the ferocity of storytelling and how passionate you are about storytelling is definitely important mm-hmm. and I definitely think that a lot of people Here's the thing about self-publishing, and I actually plan on doing a video about this. I'm going to try to do um, five videos, one per day leading up to my release day. And one of the videos is going to be about this because I'm very passionate about this. Um, Stop self-publishing your trash. Yes. Yes. And I mean that. (laughs) Look look me in the eyes. Look me in the eyes. Stop self-publishing your trash. Mm -hmm. I've read some books. And I'm going to name names. El Feast for the Sorceress by Michael Ross. Your book is trash, sir. Depublish it. Yes. Throw it in the bin. Start over. <laughs> start over. <laughs> it's horrible. Oh my God, it's horrible. Yeah. And I have a 45 minute breakdown on my channel of why. Mm. And I didn't even cover all the points. Oh. <sighs> if you're not passionate about your storytelling and if you're not serious about it, mm-hmm. and if you're not willing to sit down and really put in the work to make it good. Yeah don't publish it. Right. And I would even argue, maybe don't even write it. Because if you're not serious, I, people need to, people need to self-analyze again. People need to self-analyze and they need to say, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why is it important to me? Why do I care? Yeah. And then after, if they, if they pass that first hurdle and they say, okay, this is important enough to me. I'm serious enough about this. I'm going to do it. Then they need to look at the product of what they've done and they need to be honest with themselves Mm -hmm. and they need to say, is this any good? And if you think, and this part is not a failing of your own. If you don't know if your work is good or not, because some people have self doubt, some people don't have good critical analysis. Some people, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might legitimately not know if your own work is good beta readers, critique partners, Mm -hmm. start with your friends and family, then workshop it to may find a reader's group, find an online group, whatever you got to do, get other insight and opinion. Yeah. But don't just 
crank out your 100,000 words of trash and put it online and sell it for 20 bucks a pop because you think you made it so it's good. I'm sorry, it's not. Right. You need to be passionate about the things you do. You need to be serious Mm -hmm. about the things you do. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that. And I recently put a video up on my channel. Yeah. It's it's titled, uh, So This Is Super Embarrassing. Yes. I released the wrong (laughs) edit of my book. Yeah, the conversation we had last night. (laughs) I am super embarrassed about that. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, I again, I have no idea how it happened, but I had I couldn't find the final edit of my book on my computer. Thankfully, yeah. my mom still had it from when I emailed it to her. Oh, yay. So I just sent that to my formatter. Yeah. And I checked it. I checked the final edit. Yeah. Against the list of mistakes I found. Thankfully, most of the mistakes I found in this were not in the final edit. One of them was, which again, oh. reiterates my point I made in that video. Yeah quadruple triple even yes. five times check yourself yes, because, because hypochondriac because sometimes you eat and i mean here, here's here's the the sad reality of it um mm-hmm. any book any book on my shelf pick one any this is yeah. this is literally the bible and, and yeah <laughs> pick pick a book you're gonna find tense errors a mm-hmm. play a comma where there shouldn't be yes. um a missing a missing quotation mark no piece of published literature is absolutely 100% perfect because we're all human Mm -hmm. perfection doesn't exist exactly but strive for it please Mm -hmm. yes like I am yeah it would be so easy believe me I have been slamming my head into a spiked wall trying to get this thing perfect and I'm going to continue doing it Mm -hmm. because my consumers deserve it and I owe it to myself to Mm -hmm. do it right yeah. So as easy as it would be to just let this go to publication and let them send it out to all and say, well, it's good enough. The story's there. It, this, it, the story is told, you know, it, it, you can understand what I was saying. Yeah, but it's not, it's not nearly as good as I can yeah. do. Right. I can do but The final edit is so much better. Like the punctuation is much better. There mm-hmm. aren't nearly as many um, wrong tenses. And, you know, I have a few pronoun errors in my, in this version it's like try man (laughs) seriously put forth some fucking effort yeah and and you use the word fierce be fierce about it be Mm -hmm. determined Mm -hmm. and be serious yeah and uh you know do i obviously by my reaction yes i fucking think i bring ferocity to storytelling (laughs) i'm very serious about it my motivations drive me to extremes for it i have Oh, I have put up with so much bullshit surrounding trying to get this book published. Mm -hmm. And I have dealt with so much grief and heartache. It has driven me to the point of right to the edge (laughs) of psychotic break several times. And I keep going because when you're serious about something and you're determined, that's what you do. Yeah. Yep. Man cannot discover new oceans unless he's unafraid to lose sight of the shore exactly yep um so would you say that you have uh your journey to publishing has been a submersive education experience like you jumped in the deep end and uh, started drowning had to learn how to breathe underwater Uh, oh absolutely (laughs) absolutely like i said i'm a mechanics kid Mm -hmm. no one in my family knows anything about marketing Mm -hmm. or business or writing for that matter yeah um, my, my mom and dad both have some college, um, and my mom, Bless and my you. mom, thank you. And my mom, uh, has a little bit better command of, uh, the English language than my old man. Mm-hmm. And to their credit, m- both my mother and father are voracious readers. Yeah. And so they were uniquely qualified to actually tell me if my book was any good or not yeah and not your average set of parents that are just gonna either not read it or glance at it and say oh yeah this is good uh they are truly voracious readers i mean yeah. like thousands of books mm-hmm. they have read yeah my many many hundreds more than i have certainly yeah <clears throat> truly that i mean 
shit. My dad told me there was a period <laughs> of his life where he read a book a day for a year. Oh wow. I couldn't dream of doing that. <laughs> yeah, my dad you, yeah. you can get there eventually. I, can't, I literally can't. I can't read that fast. <laughs> I, I can't. I've tried to learn to speed up my reading pace. I can't. Yeah. I, I read very slow because I spend a lot of time. Um I have I have above college level reading comprehension. Yeah. And if I slow, if I speed up my reading, my comprehension takes a shit. It's, yeah. And I refuse. Mm -hmm. I'd rather read slow. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sorry, I do this a lot. What was your question? Um, I asked if, um, since you've become a writer, if it was more of a submersive education. right right if I, or if i jumped in yeah jumped in and yes yeah I had to learn how to breathe underwater so yeah like like i said no one in my family knows anything about marketing or business or writing and so yeah i've taught myself everything mm -hmm. and uh, i'm gonna give a shout out jenna moresi's channel on youtube yeah. meg latour's channel on youtube mm -hmm. um tremendously valuable resources yeah. they not only do they give you a lot of practical information mm -hmm. and resources, yeah. but they give you a great, a great chance to take the temperature and pulse yeah. of self-publishing and storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and both of them produced pretty good works of fiction. Meg Latour's, yeah. um, no offense, Meg. I think my yeah. story is a little better than yours. I think my book's <laughs> a little better than yours. No offense. I did like the cyborg tinker, but mine's yeah. just better. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Jenna Moresi is yeah. a very good writer. Yes. Oh she my is. God. Yeah. I have both of her novels right here. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, the, uh, oh wait, no, I don't. I lied. One of them's packed up in my stuff, but yeah, the, the savior's champion and yeah. the savior's sister by Jenna Moresi. It is yes. Jenna Moresi. Yes. Uh, <laughs> absolutely fantastic works of fiction. Yeah. And frankly, I think a lot of the criticisms fall flat. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the criticisms come from pe people portray taste grievances as yeah. as quality grievances. Right. And they're not. And they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry you don't like the way she tells the story. Yeah. Suck it. Exactly. She's very good at telling the story. The information comes across clearly. Her characters are well fleshed out. Her yeah. character motivations are clear. And the yeah. worst thing about Jenna Moresi's story is the horrendous can't spit it out trope. That is the worst thing about it. Yeah. And even that is somewhat believable because of the insane trauma the yeah. female protagonist that is responsible for the can't spit it out yes. trope has endured yeah. when you when you have people who've lived through extreme things like that mm -hmm. it's more understandable why they do these insanely stupid things yeah. and her female protagonist is horrendously traumatized her yeah. father absolutely fucking horrible the guy deserves to be tortured to death yes <laughs> i cannot i cannot i fucking hate Bronte's god oh, oh, oh. Like, oh. be like and this is the guy that we're going to split asunder vertically uh, if, starting you know. at the balls right <laughs> yeah yeah so uh so yeah and and I, it has been a, a sink or swim thing with me mm -hmm. absolutely I've, I took, I've actually taken classes from Jenna Moresley mm -hmm. on Skillshare yeah. and I've read blog posts from all kinds of people and I've read news articles and I've watched hours and hours and hours. And did I mention hours of author <laughs> tube content yeah. to self-educate mm -hmm. and the learning curve and the culture shock is immense. Uh, and I'm not very good at self-education. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I, I'm one of these people. I need someone to show me how mm -hmm. kind of people I don't self-educate well, but I've had to, uh, which is part of the reason why I've had, <laughs> you know, the pickle yeah. I had with this right. thing. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's other clerical errors that are happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. that I'm sorting out because this stuff does not come naturally to me. <laughs> right. But I mean, yeah. you've been able to get over that sort of hump by you know 
working Here, into here's the, yourself. Yeah, um, here, here's the thing. If you uh if you slam your head against the wall enough, yeah, it will eventually give. Yeah. <laughs> Or you don't apply that advice in real life, please. <laughs> but metaphorically speaking, metaphorically speaking, it will give. <laughs> yes, eventually. Or you know, you may just go insane, and then I'm already the there. Floor. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I make no secrets about that. You go to my no. YouTube channel, and it literally says somewhere between mildly and wildly insane, yes. and that's not that's not branding. That's not no, that's, just... uh, that's not a cute euphemism. Right, I'm serious people. Yeah. I've been in therapy most of my life and I've been medicated at one point. Yeah. I'm unwell. <laughs> right. Um, so, oh, where were we? Um, would you say that your having such command of your own personality and being able to understand yourself, that that is what's been one of the biggest ways to be a self-starter and push you through all of this learning curve? No, no, I wouldn't. Um, my command of my own personality and my understanding of my own psyche has little to do with it, if I'm being quite honest, because like I said, I'm bad at self-governance. Yeah. What drives me and what pushes me is my motivation. Mm -hmm. I am truly driven. I, I cannot stress this enough nothing has ever motivated me more. Nothing has ever driven me more. Nothing has ever been more important to me. That's why. So that's how you are bringing the ferocity back to storytelling is by expressing your own personal ferocity for your storytelling. Well, well, like I said, my, my motivation is, is a selfish one. It's to send yeah. a message. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, like I said, I feel that so intensely and it's so important to me that it creates that ferocity mm -hmm. here. Here's ferocity is an expression of determination and aggression mm -hmm. and determination and aggression come from a need. Mm -hmm. And needs are things that are some part psychological and some part practical. Mm -hmm. And I have a very profound psychological need to express myself in this, to express this thing about me. Yeah. It's more important than food and water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it, it generates a fair bit of ferocity. <laughs> so would you say that that is, um, I know you talked about having haters and I know you address them a lot of the time on your channel. What, um, what would you say to other people who are sort of in that mic? Mike. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, what would you say to people who are sort of in that mud pit, basically, of being surrounded by a lot of people who are giving them ne negative feedback? What advice would you give them to get past that? There's, so here's where being able to self-analyze and being a critical thinker comes in handy. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting absolutely nothing but negative feedback, mm -hmm. most of the time it's because your shit sucks. Mm -hmm. However, sometimes it's not. The fact of the matter is sometimes the world is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, I can't remember exactly which Marvel movie, but Captain America in one of the recent Marvel movies is quoted as, no, sometimes you stand and tell the world to move. And mm -hmm. frankly, I, that is true sometimes. And I feel that way about a lot of the things I believe actually. Yeah. I'm sorry. The world is fucking wrong about a lot right. of stuff right now. <laughs> yeah. So you need to be able to self-analyze and you need to be able to say, does my shit suck mm -hmm. or does everyone around me suck? Right. And 
so that so for that so the, for the person of people that's that's my advice mm -hmm. to the portion of people who are surrounded by people who say they're suck yeah. that they suck um self-analyze really look at yourself really look at your material and be willing to admit you might suck and seek to improve and if you seek to improve as much as possible and you've self-analyzed and you've weighed your material against other people's and you can't see a quality difference maybe you're just surrounded by a bunch of pieces of shit yes and that's not that uncommon because mm -hmm. guess what there's eight billion, almost eight billion people on this planet, and I'd say at least thirty percent of them are truly pieces of shit. Yeah, it's a hard reality that a lot of people don't want to accept, but there are a lot of absolutely abysmal humans. Yeah. sorry, that's the world we live in. It's true, and sometimes you're the unlucky one in life, and everyone in your life fits into that category. Yeah, so it is a possibility. Self-analyze, try to improve your work. If everyone still says it sucks, get better friends. And yeah. by the way, get better family too, because just because yeah. they're related to you by blood doesn't necessarily mean they owe you, you owe them anything. Right. I have a half brother. Mm -hmm. I would literally watch him drown with a smile on my face. And I'm not <laughs> shy about saying that because he's a yeah. terrible human being. Right. Genuinely a terrible human being. Now, if you have some people who say your work is good and some people who say your work sucks, then my piece of advice is this, and I recently acquired this. I can't, I don't know the original source, mm -hmm. but it's a truly great piece of advice. And it's this, Yeah. don't take criticism from anyone you wouldn't take advice from. Yeah. If they're not qualified to give you advice, mm -hmm. they're not qualified to give you criticism. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, and if they're, you know, if they don't know anything about what you're doing, then they're not qualified to coach you on it. Mm -hmm. Plain and fucking simple. Listen to the people who, you know, if you've got a friend, if you have, let's give you an example, because I love teaching through examples. Yeah. You have a friend who never reads anything and they read your book and they say it sucks. Yeah. And you have a friend who reads a book a week and has been doing that for years. They read your book and they say, it's a, it's a three and a half out of five. Yeah. Guess which one your book is. Exactly. It's a three and a half out <laughs> yeah. of five, which yeah. is a respectable, mm -hmm. decent piece of literature. Yeah. It's it, a lot of people, especially creatives, because our art is an expression of ourselves. We tend to latch on to the negative mm -hmm. and we dwell there because that's just human nature. Yeah. A lot of people, it's a gene. Some people, it's... Mm -hmm genetics some people latch onto the negative and do that naturally and it's very hard to get past it yeah. but you have to teach yourself to do it mm -hmm. yeah. i i cognitive vortex yep the the chemical hijack the whatever you want to call it yeah you have to teach yourself to ignore negativity when there's no logical reasonable basis behind it yeah if someone doesn't read anything and they say your story sucks and especially if they start telling you how you can make it better yeah. ignore them they're a <laughs> jackass yes <laughs> that's my advice to my fellow creatives yes and to everybody who's getting the well when are you going to get a real job uh, i told someone i said oh my god my job's imaginary and it pays me real money this is awesome <laughs> right <laughs> right i i will never understand the mentality see there's there's a boomer mentality mm -hmm. that if you don't wake up at seven in the morning and go to a nine to five job and hate your boss mm -hmm. and you're absolutely miserable that you don't have a real job yeah. and uh, fuck you. Yeah. Fuck everyone. Literally take an entire razor dildo <laughs> and shove it because your mentality is toxic and pathetic and yeah. you need to grow up and accept that some people are better at life than you and make money doing things that they don't absolutely hate. Yeah. Stop being a shitty person. Yes. Yes, exactly. Oh, if, you know, if people, hold on, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, if people would just exercise more kindness, I think. That absolutely. Would... Absolutely. There's, there, yeah, there's a shortage of kindness in the world. Absolutely. It, and, it, and it's partially because there's, there's an entire 
group of people who don't understand that being kind and courteous to your fellow man is not only a social obligation, but a human necessity. Yeah. It's literally what allows us to function as a species. Mm -hmm. We get along and function cooperatively together better than any other animal on this planet. It's what separates us from the other animals on this planet. And the fact that you refuse to do it doesn't make you edgy or cool. It makes you an unevolved asshole. Yes, which actually um, brings me to a, a strange tidbit. And I know this is kind of going off the rails here, but um, I actually noticed that all of the same things that you do consciously when you are deliberately being kind are all the same things that they tell you to do to remap your brain for heightened intellectual abilities give me an example so for instance like um when you meet a person and how you do when you want to cultivate a relationship with another person a lot of the time you will memorize them so you know you will listen to what they say but you know consciously listen to what they say in a way that you're memorizing almost so that you can play it back later so that you have something to tether the next conversation to, you know, active listening um, or actually observing different things about them, like um, observing what their favorite color is based on, you know, if that's something that they wear all the time, their habits, things like that. Those are all things that you consciously do when you're trying to cultivate, you know, a relationship with another person or bettering your communication deliberately so that they can understand you is all things that they teach you to do to actually map your brain for higher intellect but then I realized I was like but that's all the same things that you do when you're consciously being kind to another person so would you say that kindness automatically makes you smarter no (laughs) no I think there's a so being kind well, well, okay. So smarter is a little bit of a blanket word in our current, in the current nomenclature of our society. Would it make you wiser? Do you think? Yes. Yes. Better word. And yeah. I, yes, being kind is because for multiple reasons, mm-hmm. for one, it's a wise thing to go through life making as few enemies as possible. Yes. It's just <laughs> fucking common sense. And you'd be amazed how many enemies you can avoid making by exercising a little bit of fucking common courtesy and kindness. Yeah. That doesn't mean you have to be untrue, untruthful. That doesn't mean you have to compromise who you are. And, and if people perceive unkindness or discourtesy where there isn't any, that's on them and you really can't avoid that. Yeah. But yes, being kind does make you a wiser person because it's a better way to move through life absolutely yep and does that um because i know george r R. martin talks about this a lot the fact that it um being kinder actually lends to you being more of an effective storyteller because it gives you more empathy and the ability to actually write characters that are visibly separate from each other as opposed to you know um writing dialogue that all sounds like the same person right and uh i will i will concede that that is maybe one of the areas i struggle with a little bit Mm -hmm. um i have many characters in my book and some of them tend to sound like some of the others Mm -hmm. and that's on the one hand that's a little bit forgivable because they're all part of the same social circle yeah and when you're part of a social circle you all begin to take social cues and mannerisms from each other and the people who really need to sound different do sound different yeah so it's not an unforgivable holy shit all of his characters sound the same thing but i i should work on fleshing out the voice of like uh, dolge's pack especially um murday and, and steer guild definitely run together a little bit and amnes and kira probably run together a little bit too Amnes less so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I get wrapped, <laughs> get wrapped up. In, <laughs> okay. but, uh, but yes, George R. R. Martin is correct. Yeah. 
And this concept of kindness, um, there's that word is very loaded with meaning. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that tie into the concept of being kind. Mm -hmm. And empathy is one of the central ones. If you can't practice empathy, you cannot truly be kind. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, sometimes kindness does not look at all like what you think it looks like. No. Um, the fact of the matter is sometimes the kindest thing you can do for someone is say, no, mm -hmm. no, you, you, you know, you don't add an insult to it. You don't add any kind of qualifier to it. You just look them in the eyes and you say, no, yep. sometimes it is the single greatest kindness. And by the way, it can be in truly moments where you think, no, that that's absolutely not true. Guess what it is. It's like, uh, I, I'm going to use homelessness is a huge problem in our country right now. Yeah. And the uncomfortable reality, this is, a, this is a statistical fact. The uncomfortable reality is at least I've seen figures as high as 95. I've seen, and I've seen the figure go down to at least 70. So I'll say 70 because that's, you know, it's, it's a guaranteed figure. Yeah. At least 70% of the people who are homeless are homeless by choice. They're homeless because maybe they had an initial tragedy that made them homeless, or maybe they had an initial personal difficulty that made them homeless, but then they got used to it. And now they just choose to stay on the street. They deny services. This is a big problem here in Washington, where we have Seattle and Olympia. Yes. You hear all the time, these news reports, P, uh, uh, a services officer will go out and they'll go through a camp and they will ask hundreds of homeless people if they want services. Yeah. And give them a legitimate, hey, do you need a hand up? One person maybe will take them. Don't tell me it's because there are no services and don't tell me it's because there is no social safety net. It's because they want to live on the street. They've opted out of society. And so the kind of, and so here's how this ties back to the concept of kindness. Yeah. The kindest thing you can do for that people is to stop giving them a handout and force them to take care of themselves. Because by continuing to let them limp along as a parasite on society, mm -hmm. you, allow, you, you allow them to live beneath human dignity. Mm -hmm. You allow them to live beneath the human life standard that we have in this country. They could be inside. They could be using a toilet. They could be cooking their meals. They could be clean and shaven and be a member of society and actually have a healthy presence in society. But you allow them to live as a parasite that's not kind it's the greatest cruelty you yeah. could possibly conduct upon these people and i'm so i gotta calm myself down no, you're good your infinite handouts to these people yeah. is the most sickening and disgusting disservice you could possibly do to them yeah it's not kindness no stop letting people leech off society mm -hmm. sorry I'm no, very passionate you're, about you're these things because <laughs> literally right now, a no. block away from my house, there's a homeless camp encroaching on my church that I was baptized at. I'm very passionate about this circumstance. Yes. It, it's literally directly affecting me. And the number one thing, the number one thing about it that, yeah. uh, that really drives me nuts. And I know we're going off the rails toward, but hey, I just have okay. to vent about this. Yes. The number one thing that drives me nuts about this yeah. is these homeless camps are hotbeds for disease mm -hmm. and crime and sex trafficking. Yes. Which they is a problem right now. find kids in these fucking camps in Seattle. Yeah. And guess what's happening to them? Take a guess. Yeah. Take a fucking guess. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me that it's kind no. to let these people form these camps and live like this yeah. when these kids are... Yeah. Don't tell me it's kind. It's not. You're not being kind. Yeah. It's it's not at all. And I mean, and that's you know, that's I mean that's becoming, you know, a serious issue right now. Yes. You know. It is one of the most serious issues of my time uh, of our time. Yeah. It, and it it is profoundly disgusting to me that it is not the main thing people are talking about the yeah. the human trafficking that is happening in these camps yeah and and then you get these politicians and, and they talk about how how 
we have to stop human trafficking and we <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah the door uh, <laughs> we have to stop human trafficking and the, and it's so serious and this and that uh then deal with the homeless problem yeah because those camps are literal hotbeds for human trafficking and anyone who has worked with the homeless population will yeah. tell you that mm-hmm. i've listened to many hours many many hours of interviews with people who have worked in these homeless camps and they all agree yeah kids are being trafficked in these camps we can't do anything about it because the the leadership above us won't let us it's not kind it is not kind it's the furthest thing from kind yeah so i mean i i would encourage people to find ways to i don't know teach these people how to give themselves a hand up or right. you know pick them right. up by their own bootstraps and and the you know i believe me it's not that i it's not that i'm unwilling to to help out my fellow man um i'm more than willing to see some of my taxes go towards a program that restores people yeah instead of instead of just giving them a tiny home and let it, and sequestering them away in their little hovels where they can drink themselves and and shoot themselves up to death right i want to see programs i want to see my property taxes my wage taxes go towards programs that lift these people up, re-educate them Mm -hmm. and teach them how to be part of society again. I'm fine with being taxed for that. That program doesn't exist because our government wants to take the easy way out and say it's doing something without actually doing the hard work of building a successful, actually functional program. Mm -hmm. Huge problem in our society, both here in Washington and in every state that has a homeless problem. Yeah. So don't, don't look, don't look at me and tell me I'm a conservative monster because I don't, I, because I fucking hate the homeless. No tax me to help the homeless. I'm cool with it. I want results for my tax dollar because we need results. Yes. Yes. Uh, That's my diatribe about that. (laughs) So yes, kindness is an immensely valuable skill for writers. Sorry, we went off the rails That's so okay, hard there. Though. That is okay. I'm just insanely passionate about these things, and I have a lot to say about them because I'm a very opinionated person. Well, hey, that's fine. It's called Writer Uninterrupted for a reason, so feel free to, like I said, be intellectually naked and cool with it. All righty. Yeah, so, and yeah, like I said, George R. R. Martin is totally correct on that. It, empathy is an immensely valuable skill, and the ability to look at other people and other people's circumstances and other people's and 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 you know again to now oh, i'm not going to get political again i'll let it drop there <laughs> ask me another question okay um oh um all right so what uh, let's see here what would you say Well, we've gone over that. Let's see. Um, what do you enjoy most about storytelling? It's kind of a toughie. Okay. There's a lot of things about storytelling I truly love. I love getting to express myself. Mm-hmm. And I love I love creating. Mm-hmm. And I love freedom. Mm-hmm. In every sense of the word, I love freedom. And there is no greater uh, expression of freedom than the ability to create whatever the hell you want. But I think, I think perhaps more than any of that, I think the answer I would settle on, uh, the last season of Game of Thrones really fucking sucked, (laughs) but there was a gold nugget in there amidst the giant pile of shit. There was a gold nugget in there and it was Tyrion Lannister's speech to the Council of Lords. Yes. There's nothing more powerful than a good story. Truly, there's nothing more powerful than a good story. If you think I'm lying to you, see the Bible. Right. 
it's shaped the world we live in. Yeah. Along with other works such as uh, the Quran and the, uh, I, I don't know what the, the collection of Buddhist writing is called, but you know, yeah. these are stories, collections of thought that have shaped our world. Mm -hmm. There is literally nothing more powerful than a good story. It has the ability to make and break empires. Mm -hmm. And I get to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm part of that. Mm -hmm. It's fucking amazing. Yes. And through my story, I get to I get to share my beliefs about how I think life should be, about how I think people should think, about what I think is wrong and right and worth pursuing and worth giving thought to and worth ignoring. And I get to express these things. And Thankfully, I live in a country where no one can fucking stop me. Right. I get to fucking write it and publish it. And, and uh, that's, that's the beautiful little thing about, about a free market economy is I, I'm not censored yet. Yet. Hopefully it never happens. Although there's some startling things happening in our con social conversation right now, but that's, I'm yes. not going to go off the rails again. But uh, yeah, that's what I love most about writing. I get to tell a story and I get to worm my way into the collective conscious of humanity and share me and what I think and how I, how I view the world and the things I believe. And it's, that's one of the most, that is maybe the most beautiful thing about storytelling. Awesome. Um, oh, this has been so amazing. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to wrap this up here. Um, but this has been really, really good. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, and it is a would you, would you rather question. Okay. Okay. Would you rather have to speak like Yoda for the rest of your life, or? Breathe or sound like Darth Vader every time you breathe. <laughs> oh, I don't like that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Yoda. Yoda. I'll take Yoda for multiple reasons. <laughs> I'm, and I'm happy to elaborate on them if you want, but okay. Yoda, hands yeah. down. Uh, so with the Yoda thing, you at least get to, you at least get to sound sagely and mysterious to a good portion of people and you get to, and it's, and it's unique and it's a, it, it becomes a signature thing. That character is perhaps most well known for his unique speech pattern. And by the way, just so some people know, some real world languages follow that sentence structure. Yes, they it's do. It's not something that the writer just invented. They analyzed other languages besides English to create that speech pattern. Yeah. Um, so it's not entirely unheard of in, right. in the, the way of human communication. Uh, so I take that because Darth Vader's, and, he, and he, this is, here's why I don't like this question. Okay. Because uh i'm trying again trying to think how to say this concisely so darth vader's <sighs> yes <laughs> i do that in i literally do that in real life and here's why um as a kid yeah. i I've, again i've i went to therapy yeah and one of the things i learned was breathing techniques oh. and breathing techniques are central to my emotional management yeah. People would be dead right now if I didn't learn breathing as a kid. I promise you that. That's not a joke. Yeah. My anger, my ability to manage my anger and other very powerful emotions, breathing is central to it. Yeah. And I have caught so much shit over the course of my life. Yeah. Zach, why are you sighing? Zach, why are you breathing too heavy? Uh, maybe because I'm in a very emotionally stressing situation or there's a lot of social anxiety going on or whatever 
or, yeah. or, or you know, what literally just whatever. And I'm trying to breathe out the emotion and process. And you're fucking asking me about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're one of these people who just bottles everything and then goes home and gets blackout drunk. That's not me. Right. I breathe my emotions out kindly fuck off while I process my emotions in an actually healthy way. Okay. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> so I'm already irritated with people who ask me, Zach, why are you breathe? Why, why are you sigh all the time? Why are you breathing yeah. so heavy? I'm already irritated with it. If yeah. it was constant, like it was with Darth Vader, like every time you breathe, <laughs> if it was constant, like it, yeah, it would cease, it would be, it would become its own source of emotional frustration, its own source of draining, uh, draining my emotional reserves, and I'd kill people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could see how that would, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Should I have asked a better question? <laughs> But, uh, yeah that i yeah it's, it's like that it's like that fucking question was tailored to me somehow and you didn't even know i did not no oh but um this has been amazing and uh, i just want to thank you thank you for, uh, coming on here and having this lovely authorly conversation with me because you're now very soon to be an author well actually honestly i think the only difference between a writer and an author is an author finished the book. So technically you are an author. Well, well I think, I think the actual Marion Webster definition would be publication. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, technically I'm an author cause I have published poetry on the, on one of the many nooks of the internet that you have to go hunt for. Cause I'm not telling you. <laughs> so, <laughs> technically, <laughs> Technically, I am an author, and by May and May seventeenth, because that is a hard release date, hell or high water, the book is publicly available on that yeah. day. I will be a novelist, an author, novelist. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for coming on here, and it was a good time. Yes, it was. It was amazing. So um, maybe we will do this again. Or... Uh, you know, yeah, for the second book or or maybe a few months after my release so you can get pre-release and post-release yeah whatever like i said it was a good time and i'm always down to you know have conversations with people is it one of the things that makes life worth living truly yes, yes it is we bring the fun and ferocity back to story time so yes all righty well i will talk to you sometime later or, um, absolutely right. be yeah. well catch you later thank you